Welcome to South County Spotlight on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins. Welcome once again. Uh, lots going on in the town of Deerfield. We have an election coming up. We have a town meeting coming up. We have mosquitoes coming into the area. And one person who can come in to talk about all of those topics is Carolyn Ness, a member of the Deerfield Board of Selectmen, which also doubles as the Board of Health. Carolyn Shores Ness, of course, uh, your father was a legend in Franklin County politics in Bernardston. And here you are now, uh, you are the, I guess, the veteran member, right? Actually, Gilmore has uh, got a little no, more seniority yes, than Mark's you. Yes, Mark's been on there long. But you may very well wind up being the veteran member if the election goes the way it could go. There's a lot of potential change in the air for that board. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about a variety of issues today, but we want to start off, though, talking about something that you talk about a lot and is very important. We're getting into the warmer weather. We didn't really have much of a winter, which I'm perfectly fine with. However, because it was such a mild winter, uh, the possibility of a massive, even more massive tick season than last year, I think, mosquitoes, ticks, any kind of bugs, I think uh, it's a real issue of concern. And there's a number of things that are potentially very dangerous, West Nile virus, and of course the Zika virus, which is brand new. This is an area as a nurse, as a public health professional, that you are especially concerned about. So talk a little bit about why people need to be more concerned about mosquitoes and ticks than ever before? Well, actually, I don't have much of a public health background um, until I was elected to the Board of Selectmen and found out that we are also Board of Health. And so um, I take the Board of Health activities very seriously and try to go to as many meetings and as many trainings as possible. And um, a few years ago, one of the meetings that uh, Dick Kalaszewski, our health agent, and I went to was with Dr. Um, Brown, the state vet, and she was talking about mosquitoes and the life cycles. And, and probably about 10 years ago, I had gone to um, the Department of Public Health and complained that there was no testing out here. And I explained why there was no testing and trapping and all that, and, and, and it was. It was static picture, there wasn't a lot circulating. And it made sense not that they not spend that much money. Well, I have since changed my position because mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on. The Department of Public Health has no more money. So yes, we need to do more here ourselves. So I do have a warrant article about testing um, and trapping. And, it, and it, it's an outcome of three or, or four years of working together up and down the Pioneer Valley, um, trying to have a mosquito control district put together. But numerous visits to Boston and work with other communities. It's just not panned out. So we're going to put together an MOU um, so we can all work together up and down the Pioneer Valley from um, East Long Meadow and West Springfield all the way up through, through Greenfield. So this encompasses a lot of communities. Yes, a lot of communities. And But basically what we're doing is we've interviewed and gone out to look for um, who, who handles mosquito stuff? And we've picked a contractor, and um, he seems to be really good. We're still meeting with him, fleshing out stuff. But the, basically, we're as a group of communities, we're going to be able to hire one person who will do multiple trappings up and down the valley. Um, Greenfield and, and our community will be um, working together in particular. And um, hopefully, We'll be able to figure out um, what is in the mosquitoes, uh, what kind of mosquitoes we have. And that sort of goes into along the lines of um, Zika virus, because I've had so many phone calls and people being upset about the Zika virus. And we don't have the particular mosquito that is transmitting the Zika virus now. However, the Asian tiger mosquito um, is in our area. Well, at least, let me back up just a minute. The Department of Public Health and the CDC feels that the mosquito that is carrying the Zika virus now probably won't get past Connecticut, Mass Pike, well, until 2020. Well, 2020. Yeah. 2020. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's okay. like, okay. But <laughs> the, it, we do know because Mass um, Department of Public Health did do a mosquito control district out in Worcester for a, um, a you know, experimental thing and they found the Asian tiger mosquitoes uh -huh. and they can carry the uh, Zika virus. So one of the things that will come out of the trappings is to determine what kind of mosquitoes we have here and keep on top of that but then also what are they carrying. Just randomly um, last summer as everyone saw in the paper 
Department of Public Health did one trapping in, um, on the, by the Cheapside Bridge area and it had West Nile disease. Yeah. In my mind, West Nile is very serious for anybody that has an immune deficiency syndrome kind of thing, but those people know who they are and they have to be careful of everything. But really West Nile is more like you'll just get a fever or you know, a cold or flu or nothing. But, what is really scary, but when I, what's really scary to me and what is really underestimated is triple E, mm -hmm. Eastern Equine um, Cephalitis. A, yeah. And that is in orange. It has, somebody was infected, a child was infected. We know it's circulating in Belchertown. It's been up and down the valley. Um, some of the mosquitoes have tested positive, not in Deerfield because we haven't trapped, but um, it is around. And that is very, very serious, especially for children. And so to me, that's one reason why trapping is now important. Um, but then the Zika virus, there's new information almost every day coming out on the Zika virus, you know, whether it's transmitted sexually or whatever, it's now in your blood, a mosquito can bite you and then transfer it to someone else. So we, we need to figure out what's going on and keep a, you know, an eye on that. And that's part of climate change. That means we have to, as a town, just like we think of snow and ice budget, we have to have a mosquito line item that will have a basic charge, and we think maybe this 11,000, 12,000, something like that. Um, we are gonna have a contribution from the nonprofits. Hopefully they'll do their own testing up at the north end, and we can do all five testings down here in South Deerfield. But we'll have regular testing, we'll figure out what's circulating, and then we'll respond. If it's a wet year and there's stuff circulating, then we're gonna have to do some spraying. But the spraying isn't like the DGT spraying, it's, it's like the, you know, the sterilization of the male mosquito kind of sterile. Well, you know, when, you hear, when you hear about spraying, that's I when know, people, people get real nervous. I know, people freak out. But we aren't doing that yet, and yeah. we're not even there yeah. yet. Um, so people don't need to worry, but we, we will be doing some kind of mitigation. What does it cost to do a, to test mosquitoes and, and to trap them, do all that? That would think that'd be very expensive. Well, um, it's $39,000 as a town by ourselves, but because we are doing this cooperative kind of thing and working with Greenfield and other communities like um, Northampton and Amherst, um, it's going to be eleven thousand dollars, and and that we're we're trying to figure out a baseline. Like we do a baseline for our snow and ice, and then you some years is better and some years is worse, and and that's what we're we're trying to figure that out in the next couple of years, and I and we're hoping it will be like under fifteen thousand dollars, especially if the nonprofits do some of the testing up in that end of town because there's what the eleven thousand dollars is going to do is give us an assessment where we should do the trapping and i know that's we what, have that's the whole key to it right, right. Yeah. and we and we know where the trapping i mean i know we have more than five spots that we should be trapping so that's where i'm hoping the nonprofits will step up and 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 help us with that and all i know about zika is what i read in various news articles and what I understand is the real threat is that, is it affects infants, right, you know, babies. But but what about this virus? Don't we know what what should people be looking for for signs of it? Well, the thing is, this information is changing constantly, and we're hoping, as a matter of fact, the Mohawk Area Public Health Coalition is having a meeting next week, and we're hoping to have our fact sheet. We were actually hoping to have the fact sheet out for the primaries, but the information is changing so much that what we wanted was a simple fact sheet that people could just have takeaway and we we're and we're hoping to have it after Monday's meeting but basically um, you know it's a rash and you might not you might feel under the weather mm -hmm. but but it could be a numerous things it's just like the West Nile disease you know you can have no symptoms or show no symptoms or just have a mild you know maybe I got I'm a, I got a summer cold or something you know so this way it's kind of scary yeah, very I scary. mean, the, Triple E, you know you got Triple E. You are deathly sick. But West Nile can have some reactions if people have underlying health issues. But in general, West Nile is people overreact to West Nile and underreact to Triple E in my mind. And that's why we have to make steps. And the Zika is just one more thing. But truthfully, this is all climate change driven. And, and it's part of, of what we had to do. And it's a generate, I mean, this has just changed since my kids were little. Yeah. My kids used to go in the woods all the time. I, I, I don't think I've picked off more than a, a tick or two off of four wild kids for years, you know? And I, and I hardly used any kind of chemical spray on them for mosquitoes. And 
and, and we just have more bugs. The bugs are one of the big things with climate change. You have more bugs. And, um, and I, I can't tell people enough how serious it is. The Lyme disease is, again, just like um, Tripoli, it's way underestimated. You can have all kinds of long-term, really scary things. You can even have some initial scary things, but it's the long-term health impacts that are huge. And it's very common. So you've got to have um, everybody do tick checks every single day when you're outside, and your animals too, yeah. and because the animals are having ramifications, and um, and they just haven't come up with any way to any vaccines or anything uh, besides antibiotics. But I, I have to say, antibiotics. If you think you've had a tick for three or four hours, I mean, 24 hours is the standard thing, but that's not true. In three or four hours, you can have some kind of transmission. So if it's been on for a while then you need to, to, to see your doctor and make sure that you don't have, to be at least monitored. I'm not advocating antibiotics for anything, but it, you know, you need to take care of it. Now, there are a couple of products you brought with you. The whole point here, I think, also to be made is that the best way to avoid being infected by one of these things is to keep the bugs away from you. And there's some stuff you brought with you. Well, that, uh, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're still testing it. Mohawk Area Public Health Coalition, our little group of all Board of Health members, steering committee, is trying to come up with some stuff. But in the meantime, the product that it seems to be very effective against ticks, you have to spray it on your clothes. Mm. But you wear long pants if you're going in the woods in your shoes. You can spray your pants in your shoes, and it's perithium. And it's, it's just... Um, you know, you, for six bucks, you can get a big bottle and it will last most of the season. Mm -hmm. But if you spray your legs, you spray your shoes, you know, your pants, not your body, your pants, your clothes, the ticks won't want to jump on you. DEET does not work. Um, and, you and always hear that DEET's the thing that people No, uh, DEET's don't, DEET does not affect ticks. I mean, I, I, I did it personally, tested it myself, I know. This, this kind of cheap spray, the cone flower derivative, seems to work. What we're doing is trying to come up with what will work on mosquitoes, and that's what the recommendation will have shortly. It's just the weather has gotten so beautiful. People are doing yard work already, and I know I've pulled ticks off myself already, and, and so you have, to, you have to do this. But what's scary to me is the biggest, the group that is the biggest um, um, what, uh, Lyme disease occurring thing now, growth-wise, is, is the five to 10-year-olds. I know. And, and it's only because they're old enough to be independent, but they're not old enough to really check themselves really well. So please, please, um, you know, have work with your kids so that they can monitor themselves and monitor them every opportunity you get. I know last year with the discussion of ticks and tick control, there was some talk about people should mow their lawns a certain way to create a barrier between the woods if you live near a wooded area and your lawn. Well, actually what it is, is um, the animals that carry the ticks are like mice and um, deer. And people think, oh, deer, you know, I don't have any deer through my yard. Well, people have mice, little mice. Oh, yeah. And so the mice are what you want to worry about. So you just need to mow your yard and carry your, you know, do stuff in your yard that would act like a barrier around um, your house so that you don't have as many problems. And, and really, like I said, just, you know, think about mice and what where they like to hide and that's no different than the mosquitoes you patrol your yard a, a bottle cap is enough water to breed mosquitoes yeah, that's the other thing standing water has got to be out you gotta get so you have to patrol your yard every time it rains so if you have pots that have plates underneath they're going to have enough water to to um standing water to breed mosquitoes yeah. so do you water every couple days and eliminate having to dump those um little pot plates on a regular basis or do you you know decide you're going to do that so you just you have to decide how you're going to control your yard and and do it because mosquitoes really don't fly that very far so if you are very vigilant you know in a around your area and you have neighbors that are vigilant you shouldn't have as many mosquitoes if people want more information, is there a, a website or a source they can go to the town? Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to have the handout sheet, and we're going to put it on our, um, the town website, and it will be available to everybody, and we'll, and we'll 
have it at the town halls. But all the towns are doing it. This is, this is a group, just like the H1N1 that came out, yeah. we had group conversations and the state ended up using our speaking points for statewide. And, and that's where we're doing the same thing with Zika because what the CDC was saying and what the state was saying was just, it's not what people want. They want, how, how, do, how do I yeah. deal with it on the local level? So that's what we're doing. And if the state steals our um, speaking points, that's fine. It's nice of them to steal your speaking points when they couldn't help you out with trapping mosquitoes. And I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. But we we'll, all we'll, know how that works in Boston, right? Yeah. Well, we'll 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 recommend what people need to buy to that is not as onerous on your kids, um, and that is effective. And that's really what we're trying to do: is come up with the products so we can tell people this product actually, you know, through testing, through through um, research, this is we feel this is bit a big deal. It's just like. Um, during the cold and flu season, we actually had a really good match for the flu shot this year. So I hope people did get their flu shot, but there was a lot of virus circulating. And years ago, um, when bird flu came out, um, we were kind of, our little emergency group got together and um, we did a lot of research. And the only thing that seemed to really work and protect you um, as a preventative, but also if you used it right, um, but also that um, uh, migrated, uh, mitigated the, the effects yeah. of um, flu and cold was uh, black elderberry. Oh. And so this now is so common, you can buy it in Walmart, so it's no big deal. But like, for an example, if you're gonna go on a plane trip, you just start taking your tablets or taking your little spoon, tablespoonful, um, you know, before you get on the plane, a couple days before, because it's, remember, it's, it's natural, so it doesn't, it's not like a pill. But you take it and you, um, then you're building up some kind of immunity so the virus doesn't have a, a chance to, to be, um, be able to reproduce as well. And so you still might get sick, but you're not going to get as sick as much, or you might have a strong enough immune system that um, the virus is not successful. It sounds like you're really concerned about this. You, you talk about this stuff frequently, which is good. I mean, it's important to get it well, out there. Well, the problem is we have no budget, and um, people are stressed with not having enough money, and, and so you're trying to figure out common sense things to do because you really do care about public health. Uh, and so our little group is, you know, we're all volunteers, we get no pay. So what, what can we do to make our, health, our communities more healthy and deal with, you know, emerging trends of stuff? And so we do, we do get together and we do come up with some kind of stuff. I, you know, we, it's limited, it's limited, unfortunately. But, we, you know, for zero dollars, we're still trying to protect our community. Speaking of clear and present dangers to the community, natural gas pipeline, still very much in the news. You're one of the plaintiffs in a lawsuit that would potentially stop this project, uh, arguing that it's a violation of the Constitution, the ability to take land by eminent domain. Senator Rosenberg was on Beacon Hill Update recently and gave us an update on Article 97. And Stan seems very confident that Article 97 will stop this thing dead in its tracks. He seems, to, th he seems to think that uh, FERC has never seen anything quite like it, where you have protections for, for conservation land written into the actual state constitution. When you hear stuff like that, it must make you feel pretty good and a little bit, feel a little bit better about it. Um, I have to tell you, it's a roller coaster. Some days I think we're going to win, and some days I think we're going to lose. I, I think we have at least a 50 50 chance to, to beat the pipeline. And I think people are starting, it's been around. And, and being spoken about for quite a long time. So, um, you know, at least a couple of years now. I remember when we first were talking about it and I was like, you know, they're, they're really gonna use a lesser grade pipe and lesser grade welts just because we're country people? I mean, are our lives, rural lives, that much less viable, you know, valuable? And, you know, so, I mean, I couldn't believe even that kind of discussion. So we've moved beyond that the fact that they're gonna use a cheaper pipe and, you know, destroy our landscape and stuff, and, and, and to really, do we need this pipeline? And because of that, um, and now you've moved on to, well, you know, are we gonna have to pay for it in our electric bill? And it's yeah. like, oh, come on, we're gonna pay, you know, we don't even have a natural gas. If it's shipped out, off all these multitude of pipelines are built, all this gas is gonna be shipped overseas, so we're gonna be paying a higher amount because you're going to domestic product, domestic resource to an international commodity and and they pay five times what we're paying for here. So of course the price is going to go up and then we're going to pay for the pipeline on top of it yeah, no. for 20 years when they're not even going to be any gas left because all the legacy wells and, and are, are 
getting close to peak or or, or, um, or peaking. And and so it's like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, so, you were the first person to bring this up to me, anyway, the first person that I actually heard say this, that this frack gas that's gonna be going from this line is, is a finite commodity. Once it's gone, it's gone. So you're talking about tearing up tons of land, upsetting farms, tunneling potentially through aquifers to build a pipeline that could be obsolete in five to 10 years. Well, that's what's so scary to me because if you look through, it's, it's the gas companies, uh, you know, the industry's own resources. And you can, you know, there's multiple resources you can look at, but it's, it, they, they don't even have gas for 20 years. And so if you strip it out, you're talking, we're converting all our electrical generation, you know, we're close to 50% now towards natural gas and so we're going to be paying at a higher rate because it's going overseas, but then it, it's going to be gone. And then what do we do? You know the electric companies, you know, all these utilities are slow as, you know, molasses to yes. change what, how they're doing business. So in five or seven years, when there's no more gas, what are they going to do for our electrical generation? It just, it just doesn't make sense. And I, I, don't, I don't understand why. I, well, I think more people are getting the picture, and they understand this is not just you know, hippies up in the hills, you know, kind of thing. This is real legitimate kind of stuff that people need to think about. And it's investing in the wrong thing. If you took that $5 billion that we're going to have to pay in our electric bill and, and take the bonding, whatever the cost of bonding that is, that we're going to have to pay and do it for um, solar energy or alternatives and let people have interest-free loans, um, you, we would have, you know, we'd have solar um, energy everywhere. But the fat cats wouldn't get paid. No, and that's what the no whole there's point no is. benefit to corporations, I know. Uh, while we're uh, talking about town issues, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about South County EMS. Should they stay in Deerfield? Should they go to Whaley? People have very strong feelings, at least on one side of it. Um, you haven't said much that I've seen about it. What are your thoughts on SCEMS leaving Deerfield for Whaley? And, and do you support the idea of, of that happening? And what do you think of SCEMS overall? Well, it's a complicated answer, and one of the reasons I haven't been involved as much is because Mark and David have been, you know, they sit on the oversight board, and I, and I have been distracted by the pipeline. But um, I can see that it's a huge concern to people. Uh, we have a good relationship with, Con with um, S uh, Sunderland and Whateley, and it's, it's really important that we continue that. And so a lot of this discussion is very divisive and not productive. But... I don't feel uncomfortable myself um, talking with the other communities, but clearly in our community it is an issue that if we're going to pay the majority of the bill, even if it's only 52%, that we have representation. So we need to solve that. And you can do some, something relatively simple like we're the fiscal agent. Does it solve it? completely no because the fiscal agent could change but just make the fiscal agent be a voting member and then some of that issue goes away. So you agree that the, the voting should be staggered more toward Deerfield because you pay Pamela well, half the bill? the issue isn't going to go away. I mean it's no different than the frontier. I mean how many years did that percolate and then yeah. so we got changed and has really anything changed? No. So let's just deal with it. Don't let this be an issue for success, in, in, you know, in, an intervention of, of a successful thing. Let's just solve it. And I think from what I've heard, and we're doing a piece on SCEMS, and sort of what is SCEMS and how does it work, I haven't heard a single complaint about the service, just about the, the sort of the arguments around where it's going to be cited and the funding and the voting ability. Well, and that's why just let's, let's take this issue. It apparently appears to be an issue, so let's just solve it. In my mind, it's not a huge issue, but I can see, I can see why people are concerned. So let's just solve it. And then, you know, look, I mean, I'm, that's just one idea. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can do it, but yeah. I, it's, it could be as simple as that. I mean, yeah. that's not a big deal. That's gotta get addressed though. Now, moving out of Deerfield, I don't know how many meetings and how many years we've been trying to, you know, if you look at, at Northampton or Amherst, the fire departments have taken on the EMS. Sure. And that's how they pay for full-time fire. And so we've been trying to do this for years and years, join the fire departments, do, you know, ha have full-time, have EMS pay for full-time fire. Well, you know, South Deerfield is moving towards that. It's a little awkward because I'm not in the fire district, so I, ca I can't, you know, it doesn't feel right to be, go to their meetings and... Well, you are selecting them. I know, but it's just awkward. It should be somebody else pushing this. But 
it does seem like they're going, we, we met with them, we were instructed at our last special town meeting, so we, we made an appointment, or you know, made um, opportunity to be on the agenda with the uh, South Deerfield Potential Committee, and we did talk about it, and that seems like they are going towards, um, they are phasing in full-time people. Oh, really? And so, you know, maybe there is a way that, you know, we can, they can move some of the equipment out to another less expensive, because no matter what you do, it's very expensive to do anything municipal. But we have town-owned business next, sure. next door, so maybe somebody could donate some kind of, you know, temporary building or whatever, so you can move some of the equipment out that, um, you know, is in the fire department now, that, so we could put the ambulances in together. I, it, it makes, people have to understand it's very hard to have everybody spread all around. Yeah. And, and you have to have good management because there's no choice. So having the ambulance together, if, if there's any opportunities, it should be pursued. And, and it would be cheaper because we don't have to do anything to the building. Um, if, especially if something is donated for, you know, as an alternative storage. So I'm, I'm, I just feel like, you know, we have to get beyond um, concern with other issues and, and just somehow get together so that we can, you know, that having a paramedic level service that is at your door in a few minutes is critical. That is a basic, you know, we think that we, we can't lose sight of that. So somehow we just have to sit down and solve it. And well, I think a lot of the, I, and I, I, do, I think the budget issues, you know, would, would go away. Um, if we can sit down and you know have another night where we can sit down and go over the budget like we do with our normal departments, um, I I think where a lot of angst is is because we have been so tight um, with all our departments and every dime is scrutinized. We just need to do that same level of oversight on scams and and I'm not saying that it's not happening, but you know. Um, look at each dollar that you're putting aside for capital. Look at each dollar you're putting aside for all these line items. Do you actually need every single dollar? And then, you know, be reasonable, but not, but, but not hold anything um, out as, oh, well, I think we need this. What, what people need to understand is you have to have a little bit of margin because this is emergency response. So if nobody gets hurt or nobody needs an ambulance, you might go for a while with, with no calls that are reimbursable. Or, and it, it depends on the demographics, maybe everyone you're transporting has Medicaid or Medicare. And we have good demographics here. We have a lot of private insurance, so you know we, we have potential for good receipts. But the people that are calling might give us a little bit less receipts because they are, you know, on a different program. So they need a little bit of a squish room, but do they need as much as they have put in their budget? I don't know. So we just need to look at it. Town meeting season coming up. We have the election coming up. We'll have you in again, I'm sure, but I really appreciate you making the time to come in and, and talk about some stuff. And we'll be following the progress on SCEMS and the budget and everything else here as we go along. Carolyn Shores Ness has been my guest from the Deerfield Select Board. Thanks for coming in. And make sure you keep safe from those dirty mosquitoes <laughs> and those nasty ticks. And that'll do it for South County Spotlight. For this time, I'm Chris Collins. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day. Thank you.